Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Claudio Tifini and I have the honor of introducing our uh, my final speaker today, which is the other cloud, the famous one, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Claudio de Pers. Uh, Professor de Pers got his PhD from the University of La Sapienza in Rome uh, and was then a postdoc at the Washington University in St. Louis and at Yale. And then he had the faculty position in Rome and went in the Netherlands before joining Groningen, where he is now. Uh, uh, Claudio's background is in nonlinear control. Uh, he has been working over the year on many topics, from full detection to multi-agent system, uh, from uh, smart grids to data-driven control. And the only thing I would like to mention is that uh, uh, data-driven data control is, will be the topic today's uh, Claudio's talk. The only thing I would like to mention is that in 2019 he published a paper which was Formulas for Data-Driven Control, right, on the transaction automatic control, and I've checked. And since 2019, that paper is ranked number one on the most popular pa papers of the IEEE transaction automatic control, which I don't know what kind of popularity metric they use, but certainly means something for the community and for all of us. So please, Claudio, the floor is yours. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, uh, Claudio. Um, and um, thank you for being here. And many thanks to the organizer for uh, giving me the opportunity to, to talk to you today. It's, it's a, a real privilege. Um, and what I will talk about, uh, as anticipated by uh, Claudio, is, uh, is a problem in uh, data-driven control. And I will uh, focus on uh, a problem which is largely open, that is uh, how to use data to control nonlinear systems. And this is, in general, a hard problem, uh, even if you have a model. Uh, and then, uh, uh, among the possible techniques uh, that I would like to consider, I would like to pick uh, one or uh, set of, uh, of ideas that are extremely powerful, which have been uh, uh, introduced by giants uh, in our field, names like Brockett, uh, uh, Jakubczyk, Respondek, uh, Michel Fleece. And this is the idea that uh, uh, you can change uh, uh, a nonlinear system into a linear one and then exploit uh, the full power of linear systems. For instance, uh, using a change of coordinates or an immersion map. Uh, and I would like to focus on one of them. I would like to focus on the problem of feedback linearization, which exactly reduces a nonlinear system into a linear one by coordinate transformation and feedback control. So a very classical problem. And, uh, and the problem is that uh, we know that there are uh, clean, nice, necessary and sufficient conditions, but uh, those are derived in a geometric context, uh, and uh, when the, the system is uncertain in some sense, uh, applying these techniques are, is quite hard. And in fact, uh, this has attracted the attention of uh, many people in our community which have been trying to uh, solve the problem of using data to, for feedback linearization, either relying on machine learning techniques or uh, so-called direct uh, data-driven control. But uh, I think that the problem of uh, finding a change of coordinates and the feedback from data is uh, still a challenge, at least for uh, people like me. So then here I would like to focus today on uh, how to learn coordinate transformation and feedback control using data and a library of functions from which we can extract uh, the solution. Um, and the main uh, tool and the main idea would be that we design the solution from a finite number of data points and uh, then show that it, uh, it holds on the whole space of interest, on the whole continuum of points, without relying on any dense sampling. And uh, the problem still remains quite challenging for us, so we work in a very favorable setting, which is uh, that of noise-free data. This allows us to present some results which are quite clean uh, and uh, mostly self-contained. All right. So uh, the system uh, would be a, an input-affine system. X as a state, U as the control, is a, an NG or, uh, or a smooth unknown vector fields, 
an unknown, uh, I need to be a bit more precise. I will do this uh, uh, through the first um, slides. And, um, and then what I would like to do is uh, around the point of interest x0, I would like to reduce the system to a linear or controllable one via such exact feedback linearization problem. So I would like to remind you about the problem, and in particular, the, the formulation of this problem that allows us to derive the solution. So uh, I would like to find a neighborhood uh, calligraphic D of uh, this point of interest uh, x0. And, uh, accord and then uh, some functions, a function uh, delta, which lives in this uh, uh, neighborhood calligraphic D, and then uh, which, is, uh, which has m components, uh, a matrix, an m by m matrix of a functions where gamma would be non-singular on this, uh, on this uh, set calligraphic D, and then uh, a coordinate transformation uh, tau, uh, in such a way that uh, uh, the following uh, uh, equality holds. And uh, this is a particular formulation uh, of the feedback linearization problem, which is equivalent to the standard formulation of the feedback linearization problem under uh, quite mild conditions, that is, uh, there is no redundancy in the actuators, in a way that I don't want to specify. And then you see that on the uh, left-hand side of this uh, identity, you see that uh, there is a... Um, the expression of the, of the dynamics and the new coordinates, ex uh, the new coordinates tau x. And uh, on the right hand side, uh, you see that uh, there is a, a, an expression uh, that depends on a pair of matrices A, C, B, C, which are controllable matrices, a, a pair of controllable matrices uh, on which I will uh, uh, say a bit more in the next slide. And you see that uh, these uh, functions that I would like to, uh, to find appear on this right hand side. And the reason why I'm interested in this uh, identity will be clear in a moment, and I think most of you already have understood what's going on. So this is uh, uh, what you see in, on the top is the, uh, the identity that I had before, and uh, this uh, uh, matrix ACBC have this uh, block diagonal form, uh, and you see they are made of these uh, submatrices AI, BI, and uh, they are in Brunowski form, and the Brunowski form that I'm uh, giving uh, uh, here. And they have a certain uh, order, which is this uh, order uh, or i, and uh, this order sum up uh, to n. And I will assume that the C and B C is known to us without loss of generality. Okay. And then once uh, we have done the, uh, we have uh, carried out this program of finding the tau, the delta, and the gamma, uh, then we are basically done, right? Because uh, uh, the stabilizing controller will be the one that you see at the bottom. We just invert gamma of x because we are assuming that we are able to find gamma of x, which is non-singular. And then we design the k that stabilizes the pair ACBC, which is controllable. And then uh, we are stabilizing uh, the, the point x0. Uh, and the only thing that we need to take care of is that uh, the map tau that we are designing is mapping x0 to the origin, okay, in the new coordinates. And then we are done. Okay, so then uh, uh, what, I want, what I would like to talk to you about uh, more precisely, well, I'll be precise, I would like to uh, solve this exact linearization problem. That is, I would like to find these uh, functions uh, in two cases. One is uh, doesn't add anything, is when the dynamics are known, and it doesn't add anything because uh, the solution has been uh, known for uh, more than 40 years. And then uh, the case in which the dynamics are unknown, and, uh, and I want to, do the, 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 want to look at the case in which the dynamics is known because that allows me to present you the solution in the case in which the dynamics is unknown. Okay, so it's, uh, it has a propedeutical role. Um, okay. Okay, of course, I need assumptions. Uh, and these assumptions uh, I need because, I, as I said, I would like to to give you a, a solution which I can explain, at least with very elementary uh, tools, uh, in a self-contained way. And the first problem is that uh, at least the, 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 pr the first assumption is that the problem is at least feasible. Okay, that uh, someone tell us, okay, the, this system that you have is feedback linearizable. And this is because otherwise we, I would uh, need to formulate other problems like approximate feedback linearization problems, but 
I think that it's first important to understand the basic problem, right? Because uh, for us, it's already challenging. The second assumption is this uh, complete uh, uh, library assumption. That is, uh, uh, the solutions can be constructed through linear combination of functions which are on a family of functions that is, uh, are available to us. This, this uh, library can be very large. It can include uh, functions that do not play any role. But all the functions uh, that constitute uh, our solutions should be in this dictionary. Okay, that's a key assumption. So then what we would like to do is, uh, okay, we find these uh, functions, uh, we have uh, this function, we choose functions z, y, and w, and then uh, we need to find the certain matrices, tau bar, and bar, and bar, that uh, uh, define the solution to the feedback linearization problem through linear combination of the functions in, this, in these libraries. Okay? And of course, in doing so, we are uh, getting rid of a problem. That is, we are fixing already uh, the, 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 the set where these functions uh, uh, live. Eh? That's one thing. Well, with the choice of this uh, dictionary, we are already deciding where we will be working. And uh, an additional thing is that, OK, since uh, this uh, library is very large, I will also assume that uh, the dynamics that I was saying are unknown. Uh, they can always be then they can also be expressed as a linear combinations of the functions in this uh, dictionary okay and then there is a technical assumption that okay there is no redundancy in this uh, dictionary i will uh, use this sporadically but uh, i need it okay so the first thing that i would like to do before tackling the problem is to reformulate a bit the linearization condition, this uh, identity that I showed you before. Mm. So I just moved the, uh, the I just moved uh, this guy to the right hand side, so I get this expression here. And then uh, I would like to take into account the fact that I'm using a complete library of functions, so that uh, these uh, expressions here hold. And then I just replace the expression in that identity there. And then uh, I get uh, the, this expression here. This is uh, still something uh, that I'm not uh, comfortable to work with. So I take one uh, step that, OK, those are the, the, thing, the terms that you see on the right hand side are all the vectors. So I vectorize them. I vectorize each term, eh? both sides. And then if I vectorize it, what I get uh, would be an expression like this. So why do I like this expression? Well, I like this expression because now the unknowns, which are the vectorized form of the matrices uh, T bar, N bar, and N bar, appear on the right hand side of these terms. Okay, so I can put them out. And what you see instead on these uh, matrices are all matrices combined between them, so there will be more than what we have in the, in the library, and combined also with the dynamics. Okay? So here, there I will have the matrices of functions in general. And if uh, the dynamics is known, uh, these matrices are known to me. OK, then uh, the problem uh, that I would like to solve uh, is reformulated in the following way. Uh, I would like to find a vector v uh, different from 0, otherwise the problem is trivial, which is just uh, the vector form of the vectorized uh, form of these matrices I'm looking for, and such that uh, these uh, matrix of functions here, L1, L2, L3, which are the matrices here. This is L1, this is L2, and this is L3. Uh, I would like to find such a V such that uh, this identity holds on the whole continuum of points I'm interested in. That is, on uh, the domain uh, D and on uh, the space where the input U lives, uh, and uh, for all x dot that satisfy the dynamics. OK, so that's the problem I would like to solve. I have some comments on this problem. Um, this is uh, exactly the same thing that I had at the bottom of the other slide. The first comment is that uh, the equation doesn't encode any requirement uh, on the tau of x and on the function gamma of x. That is, there is no way that in this uh, uh, object that I want to solve, uh, I'm saying that uh, the resulting function tau of x uh, is a change of coordinate. That is, is Jacobian is non-singular at the point of interest. There is nothing like this. 
And similarly for the gamma x, this mwx, I'm not saying that is non-singular. On the other hand, I'm guaranteed uh, that uh, among the solutions that exa there exists at least one uh, for that satisfies these additional properties. Hmm? So at least the problem is still uh, valid. And this is because uh, of the two first assumptions that I had. The other thing uh, that I want to say is that F, if F and G are known, then all the matrices in this matrix uh, F are known to us, and I will look for a model-based solution. And this is the first problem that I will look into. If uh, F and G are unknown, then uh, I don't have the precise analytic expression of this matrix F. And then uh, the best I can do is I can try to collect uh, trajectories from my system, X, U, X dot, mm, and argue on how uh, you can use this information to solve uh, the same problem, to solve this, uh, this equation. OK? OK, so let's look at the model-based solution that is uh, a solution that uh, all of us can work out in a, in a very little time. So we want to find a non-zero solution to this uh, equation, a non-zero solution v to this uh, equation. Um, so if the model is known, f, uh, f is known, and each entry of f is known as well. But that then means that, okay, if I know everything of f, and I know also the dictionary of functions, uh, for which I can express uh, the, the dynamics, and I have the z of x, the w x, the y of x, then I can extract uh, a row vector of linearly independent functions that will depend on x and u, right? Because I have the dictionary and I have the dynamics in which the u appears. And then I can express all each entry fij of this matrix of functions as a linear combination of uh, the vector of, of basis functions times uh, a matrix of coefficients uh, cij. And that I can do for every entry i and j. But then uh, what I do, I take uh, every, I, I express uh, the identity I'm interested in row-wise. So I focus the attention on uh, one of them, on uh, the row i of this uh, equation. And I observe that this can be written uh, uh, in, uh, in this uh, simple form, I'm just expanding uh, right, the, the product, uh, the row product times uh, the vector. And then uh, what I do, I, I replace uh, fij with this uh, expression uh, which is depending on this uh, vector of uh, basis functions. And uh, I move out uh, phi from uh, the sum. And then uh, what uh, I, uh, I do is also that I, uh, instead of having vj, I express it at uh, ej transpose times v, where ej is uh, the vector j of the canonical basis where the vector v of uh, unknowns lives. OK, now I just rewrite the, identity, the equation that I would like to solve, just exploiting this information, uh, which is what I have here. And now for this equation to hold, uh, uh, it has to hold the component twice. But now I observe that uh, the phi was uh, chosen in such a way that it contains only linearly independent functions. So then this is possible if and only if this uh, uh, matrices of coefficients is equal to zero or equal to zero. So this means uh, that uh, uh, solving this equation is equivalent to solving this uh, system of uh, linear algebraic equations. So to summarize, we have shown that if the model is known, so everything is perfectly known, all the parameters uh, in this matrix F is known, this, uh, uh, this uh, equation that we are interested in, because it's at the basis of the feedback linearization problem, is solvable if and only if V is also a solution to this uh, system of uh, of uh, linear equations that I can uh, compute because I know the Cij. The row basis of uh, the, this basis functions of phi that is given to me because uh, I know the basis uh, functions, I know that the dynamic can be expressed as a linear combination of the functions in this, in this uh, basis, in this uh, dictionary. Okay, so this is the, would be the model-based case. And then I would like to show you an example. So this is uh, maybe not a, a ill-chosen uh, example. I do always the same uh, mistake. I took a polynomial system, but it doesn't have to be polynomial. It's uh, uh, 
b-dimensional system, the point of interest is x0 equal to 0. And you can, uh, OK, we can check that uh, the problem is feedback linearizable. And uh, we choose uh, a complete uh, library given by this, the expression of this z of x, y of x, and wx. And by x, of course, we have x1 and x2. So it's, it's, a, it's a very small basis function, right? And this is uh, mostly because I want to keep the dimension of the expressions uh, small. Otherwise, they don't stay within the slide. So then uh, the first thing that we have to do, we have to determine uh, the expression of this matrix of functions f, which means that we need to just uh, evaluate uh, the expressions, this function that you see here. That is, we need to replace the z, the y, take some derivatives, and uh, then the x dot should be replaced by the model that now we know. OK, so if we do this, that's what you, we will get, hmm? a matrix like this where whenever you see x1 dot and x2 dot, you should uh, replace the right-hand side of the dynamics uh, that is uh, now available. And then uh, looking at, at uh, the entry, we extract this, uh, this, uh, uh, this ve row vector of basis functions uh, phi. And in this case, it turns out to be a, a vector of 10 functions, which uh, take this expression here. Then we can find, we can express each entry of uh, this matrix F through this uh, basis, uh, and we get this uh, CIJ. I don't list them because uh, it's, uh, really, they are really big. And then we solve this uh, problem, uh, the problem, the, the system of linear algebraic equations that I, I shown before. And in this case, it turns out to be 17 uh, equations in 17 unknowns. The matrix of coefficients uh, has rank 16, so eventually, we find uh, a vector v, an infinite to one vector of solutions. v1 is the free parameter, and from which, from which we extract the t, the n, and the m that gives us the, the, the solutions to the problem. And in this case, if you solve the necessary and sufficient condition for feedback linearization, you will find uh, solutions like this. So this would be tau 1, z of x that you see at the bottom of the of the slide is the first co new coordinate, OK? And uh, the gamma x is uh, what you see there, which is uh, different from 0 at the origin, which is the point of interest, OK? So this is what you would do if you have the model. Um, so let's look now at the database solution, in which I will try to mimic as much as I can at the model based, and then point out the differences and what we can do to cope with these differences. OK, so the database solution. So the problem that we want to solve is uh, still the same, right? And the matrix F uh, is uh, still uh, this, uh, this matrix uh, here. We're now uh, ex the precise expression of x dot that appears uh, here is not precisely known in the sense that we know what are the functions that are appearing there, but the coefficients we do not know. Mm? So then uh, we cannot. Uh, repeat exactly the same approach that is computing this uh, vector of coefficient cij. We need to do something else. And the idea is uh, trivial. We collect the data. And why collecting data is useful? Well, because the dynamics uh, uh, appears in the form of uh, the state derivative. Okay? And then that is something that you can compute. And we compute L samples of them. And of course, you might raise the question, OK, but this is a uh, you are also measuring the state derivative, it's a lot. You are also not considering any noise, so this is very uh, unrealistic. I agree with you. But this thing of uh, the measuring the state derivative is something you can avoid. But I don't want to enter into this becomes, because, because it becomes uh, quite uh, technical. And it's true also that uh, the problem is quite uh, idealized, but it's, it's because I want to understand the basic of the problem uh, of combining uh, classical control problems and data. All right. So we collect this data set on the domain of interest. Mm. And then we do one uh, simple thing. Uh, we do not know the f, so we evaluate the f at the sample points. OK? Right? Because we can do it. Uh, the f depends on x, u at x dot. So if we have the samples, uh, we can evaluate f at, this, uh, at these points. And then uh, the idea is uh, very simple. We form a matrix that we call, call uh, uh, calligraphic F, which will depend on the data set. 
And that's uh, just, uh, um, so what we do, we, we evaluate, uh, sorry, we evaluate uh, the matrix uh, F of functions at the samples, at every sample, and then we stack one on top of the other, okay? And then we construct uh, the candidate solution to solve our problem. And of course, the candidate solution is to look for the V that solves the matrix, the system of algebraic equations, calligraphic F times V. And what is the reasoning behind it? Well, if I do not know F, but I know F at least at the samples, the best I can do is to compute the V that solves the system of algebraic equations at the samples. And then uh, I cross the fingers. Because in general, there is no guarantee that uh, the solution that we find in this way will uh, continue to hold on the whole, uh, on the whole space of interest uh, we are interested in. OK. So then we need to introduce something more. And we were not able to solve the problem in a different way. So we, we needed to strengthen the working assumptions to give a solution, to even to this uh, highly simplified problem. And so I would like to, to introduce this key condition. Um, so recall uh, what we did for the model-based case. We introduced this uh, basis functions uh, phi, this matrix, of this vector of basis functions phi, looking at, uh, at basically the dictionary of functions that we are uh, considering. And then we expressed uh, each um, entry fij of the matrix of functions uh, through, this linear through a linear combination of this uh, uh, function in uh, phi and the vector cij. The only problem now is that uh, this uh, cij is not available to us any longer, right? Because now we do not know precisely the dynamics. So then uh, we need to compensate for this. And the idea is to uh, introduce a condition on the richness of data that in this case takes this uh, form that, uh, okay, again, we uh, evaluate the vector of basis function phi on the samples. Then we stack again these evaluations, so one on top of the other. This will give us uh, a, a matrix uh, uh, L, where L is the number of samples, times the number of uh, functions that uh, is in the dictionary or in the basis function in the vector of basis function phi. And we, then we ask this uh, matrix to have a full uh, column rank. OK? So then, uh, uh, for instance, if a phi only includes uh, the x and the u, this will be the classical persistence excitation condition that uh, m many of us have been using uh, in this uh, uh, direct data-driven control based on uh, the so-called uh, Willem's fundamental lemma. Now, this assumption, which is assumption that I do not know how to satisfy because I will just check every time I run the experiment, I collect data, I form this matrix, and I check. I don't know how to design experiments that guarantees me, uh, guarantees me that this condition holds. This is quite an open problem. We know this all from uh, more general problems. So this, impose, this condition imposes also a, a lower bound on the number of samples that we need to collect. OK? And, uh, that is, uh, uh, the number of samples has to be at least greater than the number of functions that you have in the row vector of basis functions phi. Okay, so the more functions you put in your library, the more samples you need to collect. If you want this condition to be uh, satisfied, it's a necessary condition, of course, not sufficient. Okay, so then uh, let's go back to our problem. Um, is uh, we want uh, to use the data set that we collected, and we would like to find v different from zero, such that uh, this identity holds on the domain of interest. And to this purpose, we have suggested that uh, there's a matrix here, which is the matrix of these coefficients f evaluated at the samples, uh, uh, is useful for our purposes. And the first uh, thing that I would like to do, and this is, will be the main result uh, of, this, uh, of this talk, it's a trivial uh, consideration, but it's useful, that uh, if I find a V that uh, satisfies uh, the identity that I want to, to solve, then for sure the V has to belong to the null space of the matrix calligraphic F. 
and this is uh, clear, right? Because uh, if, uh, if the star holds uh, on the continuum of points, it will, start, it will uh, hold also on the samples of the uh, on the samples that live in this uh, in this uh, that are, uh, that is taken in this space. A more interesting result is uh, the following one. Suppose that this uh, richness of condition uh, uh, um, uh, um, richness of data condition holds, the one that I introduced before. Then what you can show is that if a v belongs to the null space of this matrix F, then it satisfies the identity we are interested in on the domain of interest, on the continuum of points. So, so we are going from the sample space to the continuum of points. And, the, the, and the, the, the arguments are very easy, so I will show the arguments, because uh, it doesn't take much to go through them. So we want to show that if V belongs to the null space of the matrix F, then uh, this V will also satisfy the identity uh, F of V equal to zero, for all x, u, and x dot that satisfy the, those relations. OK, then uh, I start again, as uh, we did for the model base case, uh, that uh, f times v equal to 0 uh, satisfies this relation row-wise. Right? I'm writing this uh, identity. I'm uh, writing the identity i of this, uh, of this, uh, uh, of this identity, I'm, uh, the row i of this identity, yes. And then I replace uh, f i j with uh, the expression of phi transpose uh, times cij, as I did for the model base case. OK, so then this is still model based. And now what I do, I just uh, rewrite the f in a slightly different uh, way from what uh, we did for the uh, model base case. And it will be this, uh, the product of this matrix here and this matrix of coefficients here. Now, the issue is that the Cij, I don't have it. And I would like to have uh, this condition satisfied for all x and u. Let me call uh, this uh, matrix of functions uh, phi, capital phi, and this uh, uh, matrix of coefficients gamma. OK. Now, uh, by definition, uh, f, the calligraphic f on the data set has uh, precisely this expression here. So, but I gave this expression of f in this form, so I can rewrite the calligraphic of f in this way, like uh, the product of this matrix, matrix phi computed at the samples, uh, and then I stack one on top of the other, and I have a common factor, which is uh, the gamma here. And now there is a technical result, and this technical result uh, takes a very little, it's not a deep, uh, it's, it takes very little to prove that, that uh, if this uh, uh, richness of data condition holds, uh, that is uh, necessary, so it's equivalent uh, to have that uh, there's a matrix uh, of uh, coefficients phi, so of a uh, capital phi computer the samples, as also full common rank. But then we are done because, uh, so V by assumption belongs to the kernel of, uh, of this matrix calligraphic F of D, oh sorry, but uh, then uh, this means that uh, because this uh, matrix here has full column rank, the only way is that V belongs to the kernel of gamma. But this implies then uh, that when I look at uh, the, the product of the matrix of functions F times V, this becomes phi, capital V times gamma times V, and because gamma V is equal to zero, then this holds for all X and U. That's the end of the, of the proof. OK, an example. I'm a little uh, late. So it's uh, the same example as before. Um, and now I'm just changing uh, the dictionary simply because now it's just a matter of computing the kernel of, the f of, the, um, of a matrix, so it takes very little. So I could uh, use a big Z, uh, slightly bigger than this. And then uh, we run an experiment. We collect 100 samples. Um, we check that the richness of condition is satisfied. And then uh, uh, we check that in this case uh, the nullity of the matrix, so the dimension of the of the of the kernel space of this uh, of this uh, matrix is equal to one. And then uh, we can compute the the kernel. We can compute the basis of this kernel, and it uh, returns these uh, matrices as T and M, which coincides with the model base solution. Okay. Okay. So I have uh, three comments, and then we are done. So. Uh, uh, quality of data. Um, 
So the main condition is uh, there's a richness of data condition, right? And you might wonder whether it's necessary. It is not, uh, because, OK, we know if the nullity is equal to 1, that is, if the space is the dimension of the null space uh, is equal uh, uh, to 1, then we know that uh, this uh, implication, that if V belongs to the null space of the matrix calligraphic F, gives a solution to the, identi uh, to the equation we are interested in, holds without requiring any richness of data conditions. So there are cases in which this richness of data condition is, uh, not, known, is not needed. The other remark that I have is that, uh, OK, we need a really good data. No noise is, uh, is allowed, because otherwise we'll go over into overfitting. And then the only way that we can uh, try to do to uh, avoid uh, uh, really bad solutions is try to ameliorate what we have, either by data denoising or by solving uh, non-convex problems, as the one uh, there, that guarantees some kind of sparsity. Okay. The second com comment regards uh, the, the space of solutions uh, the uh, kernel of this matrix calligraphic F. So, OK, we pick uh, this V in the, in the kernel, and then we construct uh, these uh, solutions, these matrices T, by taking the, inver the vector inverse of V, and then we compute uh, these functions. We assemble these functions. And in general, we said before that uh, there is no guarantee that the resulting uh, change of coordinates tau of x equal to t times z of x uh, will be non-singular, and that this matrix of functions gamma of x will be non-singular, uh, non right? But we know that at least one uh, is there, OK? So then, uh, in general, what you have to do, one, uh, once you have computed this null space, you need to extract those vectors of v that gives you the solution that you are looking for and that solves the feedback linearization problem. And at least one is there. Now, this you have to do in most of the cases, but there is one special case when uh, the, input, the system has one, uh, on one uh, input alone, in which uh, uh, any vector v that you, you, you ex extract from the kernel will be such that uh, the functions that you, uh, that you uh, construct are a guaranteed solution to the feedback linearization problem. This tau of x is a, is a change of coordinates, and uh, uh, mwx would be non-singular. Okay? And uh, the proof here is where you really exploit this interplay between the data and the, geometric, the traditional geometric proof of, uh, of uh, Roger Brockett, for instance. Unfortunately, this result doesn't carry over to multi-input uh, systems. Uh, there are simple counterexamples in which you show that this doesn't uh, hold. And that's something that we still have to understand. OK, one uh, final comment about uh, the impact of the choice of dictionary on uh, how big is uh, the space of solutions. So then uh, I didn't uh, specify this, but uh, uh, suppose that you have the z of x, the y of x, and the w x, and you start combining them through these uh, matrices T and M that you just generate randomly, let's say. Mm? And then you start finding out that uh, some of these solutions that you are assembling uh, in, this, uh, in this way um, actually solve the feedback linearization problem. That is, they solve this, uh, this equation, and therefore you are guaranteed that they must belong to the null space of the matrix calligraphic f of d. But then this leads to think that, uh, OK, that if you include more and more functions in these dictionaries, uh, there is a chance that this will impact the space of solutions. And in fact, the space of solutions might increase. And I would like to illustrate this with a simple example. This is uh, the same example as before. Previously, I was uh, choosing uh, this uh, uh, dictionary of functions. Now I'm extending it, of course, in a, in a smart way, not because I'm smart, but because I'm, I know the solution. So I'm including now all these functions that uh, depends on the difference x1 minus x2, because the solution to the feedback linearization problem is a solution to the a transport problem. Uh, that's the PD that uh, we are solving. OK, so then. Uh, in this case, what you can check by running exactly the same experiment is that the nullity becomes equal to 2. And because the system is, mo is a single input system, all the solutions that uh, you find in the kernel of the matrix F are the solution to your feedback linearization problem. So here are two, uh, two examples that correspond to uh, an orthonormal basis of the, spa of the null space uh, kernel of the calligraphic F. But any combination of these uh, solutions will give you still a solution to the feedback linearization problem. OK, so then uh, conclusions. 
uh, I wanted to show uh, a simple uh, condition for extending a, a solution uh, of the exact linearization problem, a classical problem in our field, from a finite data set to a continuum without requiring this uh, dense sampling. And the motivation was that this idea that you check something on a finite data set and then you try to extend it uh, to a continuum of points, this is a recurring theme in data-driven control. And in fact, we think that this can be useful in many, in many other problems if we manage to, f to understand deeper what is going on here. And at the foundation of some of the results lies a real ni really nice interplay between geometric control theory and data. And that was one of the motivations to, to, do, this, uh, to do this. And another mm, strong motivation for us was to convince ourselves that we could, we could still create interesting problems from classical control just by combining with a uh, principle of uh, data analysis. And future work, there, are m there is much work to be done. Uh, noise is an issue. We would like to solve immersion problems. And incomplete uh, libraries, that's another big issue. And before thanking you, uh, let me thank my co-authors, uh, Pietro Tesi at, University, at the University of Florence, uh, Darshan gadgin Matt, and uh, Fabio Pascoletti at UC Irvine. And that's what I have. Thanks. We are a bit short on time, but maybe it is time for one quick question. Do I see any? There. What goes wrong if you have inexact? Wait, take the mic. Everything goes wrong, everything collapses, because uh, uh, there is a, a bunch of, uh, uh, because we do not, so the only thing that I could think of is try to solve an approximate feedback linearization problem. But that means that I need to take into account a sort of a representer theorem and work with infinite dimensional uh, cis representations of this uh, space. And at the moment, I have no clue on how to do it. OK? I would uh, first try just uh, with simulations and see. But I think it's uh, really needed uh, something similar to a representer theorem. So. Maybe one more, quick. Microphone. Uh, for the uh, identification of the nonlinear uh, system. So I, I don't know which problem you would like to solve here. The problem is really uh, uh, feedback linearization. So. Uh, and for other problems, I, I, we should think about, okay, what are really the goals? Eh? Th that's a really focused problem, because I think already here, uh, already in this way, the problem is quite challenging. Thank okay, you. so let's give Claudio another round of applause. <laughs> Claudio.